Hi, everybody, and welcome to Harvested Financials podcast. Here we're going to talk with investors about their journey through personal finance and how they became interested in options and the markets. But before we get into that, I'd just like to give a disclaimer about our services. I'd like to remind everyone that today's session does not constitute financial advice and that the views of both of the speakers are their own opinions and should not be construed as an endorsement of any strategy or an offer to buy or sell securities. This is purely for educational purposes and the trades discussed are all simulations for the purposes of example. All right, welcome to our podcast number two from brought to you by Harvested Financial. Working title, The Weekly Cultivation, but we'll work on it. Uh, today, I'm okay. very excited to be talking your journey to personal finance with Darlene. Darlene uh, leads our community yield effort here at Harvested Financial as we look to bring financial literacy to teenagers uh, in the greater Chicago area, which is just really important to all of us here at Harvested Financial. And Darlene's done an amazing job in getting us to the point where we can um, begin uh, working with uh, teenagers uh, to understand money better. So with money in mind, let's talk about your journey to personal finance today with Darlene. So Darlene, first, a big welcome from me, Ian Maddie, your host, and Harvested Financial. And today we're going to go through Jar Darlene's journey to personal finance. We'll talk about my journey a little bit. And eventually we'll get maybe a couple more advanced topics like options, but along the way, we'll kind of just, you know, have a discussion, learn some vocabulary, and we'll have a couple uh, other segments that I personally like to, to fit in, which is we're Harvested Financial, we love agricultural terminology, maybe we'll discuss some agricultural terminology, and also I'm looking for a, a, a good intro song and I need Darlene's <laughs> assistance because my first uh, uh, guest, Mr. Trading Beard Ken, was not as much help. Um, so we're gonna work on that. So, all right, welcome Darlene. Thank Darlene, you. Welcome. Tell us Thank a little bit so about uh, what, you know, what brought you to begin understanding finance and personal finance and the stock market. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Ian, for having me as your guest. I'm super excited to be here. A little nervous, but not really. <laughs> um, well, I became interested in uh, just learning more about financing and and um, you know all the uh, investment options that are out there for me that I personally don't really know too much about. Um, so I became interested in 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 learning more about that uh, during you know in Mar in about in March. Um, during, you know, when everyone started working from home, there was so much uncertainty going on. And I figured that, you know, it, now's the time. Now's the time to uh, stop being so afraid of finance, the finance world, and, and start doing something about it. So I'm, you know, slowly but surely getting, uh, you know, learning more and more each day. And, um, and I'm, pretty committed to to uh to this financial journey and uh excited about you know all the new opportunities that are out there for for an investor like myself oh, that was great darling um you just you know you said a bunch of awesome like really interesting phrases that um will help anybody new to um, investments and wanting to improve their own kind of finances, understanding uh, how to manage uh, their own money better, make it grow. Um, and you said, stop being afraid of the financial world and being committed to this journey. Two really, really important, you know, just steps because it can be daunting the task of, of understanding, you know, just savings and checking and money market accounts and then how do stocks fit in and 401ks and 529 plans. Um, but Right. There's a lot of misinformation out there. It's just a lot of disparate information out there. But the good news is that there is good information out there and you can, you know, look at it from just your own perspective. You don't have to get crazy into all kinds of different numbers. I, everyone talks about data these days, right? You know, let's look at the data. Let's look at the data. Data is great, but you have to be able to analyze the data and understand it. And a lot of times when you add more and more data information, 
you just continue to get lost because there's just all kinds of problems, you know, with assumptions and um, we're looking at it, tons of data. So we're going to talk about stepping back and just looking at little bits of data information that tremendously important and helpful. And like you said, committed to this journey. That's, you know, I, I think really just ties nicely to what Harvest Financial wants to do for its client base and potential clients is, you know, commitment to kind of looking at the financial world in a systematic way so you can manage both your current and future, um, you know, financial portfolio, right? So you don't want to necessarily have to have um, something like March happen where all of a sudden the stock market, you know, drops a lot um, or, or maybe the opposite, maybe it goes up a lot. Like what, what does it mean to, to your portfolio and your own personal like situation, right? So let's get talking about some of that. All right, so you said investment options. So let's talk about just some, some terminology. Like when we talk about, you know, stock, the three main things, or let's say four, stocks, ETFs, indexes, and gold. Like what do you know about all four of those? And do you have any investments in any of the four of those? You can say vaguely, you don't have to give the, the exacts. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I know, you know, stocks, of course, like that's like the first, I think it's like the first uh, term I learned. Um, ETFs, I know they're exchange uh, trade funds. Um, you mentioned what, what other in, one did you? Indexes in gold. Yes, so I know the I know the three major market indexes, the indices, the Nasdaq, uh, the uh, Dow, the Dow Jones, and the S and P five hundred. Um, and I currently have a diversified portfolio, ETFs portfolio with a, a Roth IRA. I recently uh, started that. I used to um, have four or three Bs. I'm in the nonprofit world. So I used to uh, have about, I think two, four or three Bs, but now I'm just focused on this, uh, on my Roth IRA. And hopefully when I get a, another nonprofit gig, um, I'll have a, and I'll have an opportunity to start another 403B with that organization, so. Excellent, all right, definitely really good. Uh, you, you're really given, uh, providing some excellent uh, terminology, <laughs> right? And just, it just means that you're looking at the financial, the world, financial world in the right way. You're framing it in the right, um, from the right perspective. You diversified portfolio in your, in your Roth IRA, right? You want some diversification, which we talk a little bit about as we, talk about some of these kind of major, you know, finance terms that you'll see all over the news, or if you go to just like, you know, Yahoo Finance or something like that, or Market Watch, and you'll see, well, stock, right? You have stocks, and then you have ETFs. So everybody knows stocks, right? We know Disney and Apple, um, you know, big names, Tesla. Um, so when we look at stocks, right, you you can buy a very, 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 very small, like ownership, you know, in that company, really small. Um, you know, my little guy thinks that, you know, we can buy Disney and, and make some decisions for them. You know, <laughs> Disney's not going to let us make uh, too many decisions yet in terms of their content they're providing across Disney Plus and all their multimedia assets. But right, you are owning in, you know, some really, really, really small sliver of, of the company. Um, and obviously it can grow over time. Um, ETFs. Now, this is where derivatives come in, right? Harvested, Harvested Financial discusses, you know, uh, uh, that we want to bring derivatives, that derivatives are for everyone. So this is a great time to just talk about the term derivative. So when we look at derivative, uh, when we look at what's in that word derive, right? So you're just deriving value from an asset, from an object, something, right? So ETFs really aren't a derivative of stocks. So all it is is really is just a long list of stocks that a company kind of put in a big package and say, you know what, if you don't necessarily, because some of these stocks are really expensive. Um, so you may not have the money to buy a hundred shares each of Disney and Tesla and General Electric and, and, America, uh, and Intel, right? But you'd love to have exposure um, and to diversification with all these different, you know, stocks. And you're like, well, you know what, I don't have, you know, whatever amount of money to do that. ETFs are a way to do that. So they basically take all these stocks, put in a big package and say, okay, we're calling this, um, you know, your ETF. Um, and you actually get to own, in essence, 
little slivers of lots of different companies. Now, they're all different types of ETFs. You have ETFs based on the major indexes, indices, like you said, like the SP 500, the Dow Jones 30 index, but then you have all kinds of uh, ETFs that represent the oil sector, the oil services sector. You actually have gold ETFs, you have natural gas ETFs, you have socially um, um, uh, um, good, uh, do good uh, ETFs for companies that are, are looking to actually um, help the environment uh, and not be wasteful, right? So there's all types of ETFs that represent all types of different stocks, which are great for someone who, you know, for like most people don't have just millions of dollars to kind of just buy hundreds of shares of stock in each of these different companies. You can just buy an ETF and get a little sliver of each one basically. And they're great because they're traded on an exchange, which just means that when you go onto your account, wherever it is, brokerage wise, or through a registered investment advisor, you can actually buy and sell these products right there, what they call listed. They actually, it's an old timey, it's old timey terminology listed. It just means that it's standardized. It's easy to buy and sell it. Uh, it's even easier now than it was 20 years ago. Um, so an ETF really is a derivative. It just derives its value from all kinds of different stocks together. Uh, indexes, we talked about those, right? Everybody knows the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In fact, I have uh, uh, a little, uh, there's my Dow Jones Industrial Average right here is a chart, right? Everybody loves charts. Um, actually, we're gonna talk about charts a little bit after. So I'm just gonna go click all. So I do believe this is the Dow Jones since, you know, 1980. And you could see a nice rise up from, you know, I zero. I don't think it's displaying it, Ian. Oh, it's not displaying it? No. Ah. There we go. Wait. How about now? Yes, there we go. All right. So you see the nice meteoric rise from zero-ish to now 26,580. Um, so we're going to talk about charts a little bit too after. I think it's important. But you can, there's all different companies that basically take these stocks from the Dow Jones Industrial Average and kind of package them together to an ETF. So any retail investor, which is you and me, can purchase them. Um, so there's a lot of financial innovation in the last decade, which is opens up a lot of possibilities for investors to take part of trades and strategies that were never possible for anybody previously other than the super rich or you know, um, actually professional trading firms. Um, so it's a really a, an amazing opportunity for investors to learn about um, different investments that can fit into their portfolio that are all listed, all possible to buy through the exchanges, through a regular brokerage, through a regular investment advisor like Harvested, right? So. That's really a, a great thing. So I'll stop for a second. Uh, any questions about uh, an ETF or an index? Could you explain what the uh, on the on your uh, on your screen what the numbers mean? The the twenty six thousand. Uh, yeah, like what are those numbers? That is an excellent question. So twenty six thousand five hundred eighty five. So there's thirty companies in Dow Jones Industrial Average. Each company is worth a certain amount of money. So what happens is each index, and there's, you know, people know about some of the, the, the primary ones, but there are a lot of indexes. Let's just take the primary ones like the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, which has 500 stocks, the Russell 2000, which has 2000 stocks. And what happens is for each index, each one says, okay, when we start, we're going to calculate the value of this index a certain way. They can actually be calculated in different ways. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average um, has a calculation each day. So now you can actually see it's a bad day for the stock market. It's down 800, eight, almost 880 points. So what happens is, is that based on the movement of each stock in that index generates a different value, a different amount to the value each day, right? So it might be something where if it's um, like market cap. So you could have a company that is worth you know, a hundred billion dollars and you can have a company worth 1 billion. So the company worth 100 billion is way more valuable than the company worth 1 billion. So if the company that's worth 100 billion is basically unchanged for the day, but the company that's only worth 1 billion is down 50%, it doesn't necessarily mean that your index, your index is going to go down a, a lot because the company that's worth a billion, a hundred billion is, did nothing today, it's zero change. So some indexes say, okay, we're not gonna necessarily look at the change in every index, in every stock and just kind of um, 
you know, add them together and that there we have a new value. They might say, we're gonna multiply it by, you know, the market capitalization of the company, which market capitalization is just the amount of shares that exist in the world times the stock price. Like Apple, I don't even know how many shares Apple has. It's a lot, um, yeah. billions. <laughs> um, but you have a lot of small cap companies that might have 20 million shares. So indexes are, are calculated differently. And so for the Dow Jones or S&P 500, this number 26,600 is just a representation of the way they calculate it and how it changes every day. So whether it's based on market capitalization or you know, sometimes they don't care about market capitalization and just say, you know what? We have 2000 companies. We don't care about market capitalization. Just if, if one stock is down 10%, that's equal weighting to whatever other, you know, to all the other companies. Um, so, and that number, you know, I remember when the Dow Jones hit 3000, I think I was 17. I think the Dow Jones hit 3000 and then it's been marching up slowly, sometimes, sometimes fast. Um, for the last 20 something years. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you exactly how long. So that was an excellent question. And, you know, it kind of brings us to charts. Charts can be misleading, right? You have to yeah. be, one of the things we're going to talk about with community yield is understanding charts because not that people are necessarily going to, you know, present the chart that is misleading on purpose, but, you know, we talked about data and information. You have to be careful about what you're looking at. You know, obviously this is just one day. You can look at different time frames. Right, somebody can just show you a time frame of you know three months and tell you how great an investment is. But if you look much longer, it's not. So you want to look, you know, really understanding uh, how to read a chart is important. It's probably a good um, podcast webinar in in the future. Is the website MarketWatch accessible to everyone, or do I have yes, to? This is start MarketWatch is just. Uh, I, I just wanted to show you as an example that there's a lot oh, of just interesting, right. you know, informational websites out there like. Um, market watch. You can go to Yahoo okay. Finance, right? If you want to just send, you know, see information about the the major indices, um, okay. right? If you just click on Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? And you see generally when you pull up something like a market watch, you see the major indices, which is the Dow Jones, the Dow usually, the S and P 500, the Nasdaq. Um, you got to be a little careful about the Nasdaq. There's a couple different Nasdaq uh, uh, indices. I believe this is the composite, which includes all the issues. And then you see gold and oil um, and global Dow, which must be, you know, large companies throughout the world. Um, and then how you see crypto for Bitcoin. So uh, there's clearly a lot of ways to invest now. We didn't talk about gold, but instead of buying gold bullion, like you may have had to in 1980, um, you can actually buy a gold ETF to get exposure or basically own a piece of gold, right? The price of gold goes up, your investment goes up. So it's a lot of really interesting uh, ways now that investors can take part in, in um, you know, managing their finances. And, and like you said, being committed and having the confidence to learn about it. So um, your portfolio can grow over time. All right, so we talked about stocks, ETFs, how ETFs really are derivatives and they derive a value um, from uh, different stocks. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the indices and gold uh, and how you can actually participate in the value of gold without owning gold bullion, right? You can participate in oil market without owning oil futures or, you know, having your own barrels of oil, right? In, in Cushing, Oklahoma. So it's really <laughs> like a unique time um, to learn about different um, investments. All right, so you're at the point now, you're learning about, uh, you know, you have your IRA, you're learning more. Um, do you have, uh, let's see, you know, uh, for my own personal, you know, finance journey, I, I was younger, I was around 13 and I learned about stocks and it's wonderful. I, I, I'm not, I can't say exactly why I got interested in it. I just one day started, you know, learning about it. And then it was just fascinating to me. And at the time, Prodigy was one of the first web content providers. I don't, do you remember Prodigy? I'm older. No. <laughs> okay. I'm older. It's okay. Well, I am 36. <laughs> I'm older. It's okay. So Prodigy was, I think Prodigy was even before AOL. Prodigy. So Prodigy was this, like, instead of just going to the, the bulletin board on the internet, and you had all these little, like, like built bulletin board systems all over the place, old school, there was something called Prodigy. And it was basically almost like an initial Yahoo 
type thing. And, you know, I learned about stocks that way. And <laughs> wow. so it was a lot of fun because I would have a page like this before Market Watch existed. Prodigy basically had information like this. And I got, once I got it and my parents, you know, were persuaded to pay whatever they had to pay <laughs> a month, I forget what it was. Um, I was hooked. I was like, this is amazing. And I learned lots about stock market through there. And I was fortunate to get a, a small stock account when I was younger and invest and learn. And, you know, I, I was hooked, obviously. I'm still doing it. So, um, but I think my takeaway from that is like, you have to kind of get your feet wet and you have to learn a little bit, right? You don't have to invest everything you have right away. You know, you can learn um, by doing a little bit, right? And then really help yourself um, build so, good portfolios. Do you think you're like self, I mean, self-taught? How did you, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, self-taught, I, you I know, mean, I was 13, just, just <laughs> I'm not sure what exactly made me too interested. Like my piece, sometimes people would ask me like, oh, your parents like stockbrokers. And the answer is no. Um, and, you know, I had one great uncle Normie who is uh, a good, a really good stock investor as I learned, but I didn't, I mean, I never really talked to great uncle Normie about it. So I, it was just something I really got into. And I think having something like Prodigy and being able to find information on it was really helpful. And it just connected with me. Um, and I just read up a lot about it and I, I really enjoyed it. So, and I look for stuff on it. Uh, and I think that's, you know, what we want to do with all our webinars and podcasts and resource center. We want to provide different types of information so you can learn about, you know, starting like, oh, okay, simple investments, stocks, bonds, what's an ETF, um, what's gold, what, what, what is an index, how does it relate to, you know, derivatives, and we're going to talk about options for a couple minutes uh, in a little while. So I think that's what happened with me. Like I was just able to find content about stocks and it, it really helped me kind of uh, learn more. So on my own, right? You wanna learn from somebody else. You wanna be able to put, I think webcasts are great because you can just, you know, take your time and, and listen and watch, but then, you know, you, you wanna do a little bit of research and, and thought on your own and, um, you know, get to the point where you're, you feel confident in, in, in your fin in, uh, financial future uh, investing, right? You have you have uh, the, the Roth IRA. Maybe at some point you'll want a, you know an actual a, a separate um, um, taxable account. Let's call it right a non-retirement account, right? You can have a regular, Definitely. you know, investing account that more and more right has the ability to then add other interesting uh, ETFs in it, uh, and then onto options. So there's a lot of different ways, right? You can tie your money market account to it. So there's it's a lot of a lot of choices now, um, but you can definitely. I, I definitely suggest like you can go slow, right? You can say, okay, I'm learning from your your IRA, IRA, and how is it performing? Why did this go down when the market went up? Why did this actually work when the market went down? Right, that might be even nicer, right? Right. right? Wow, the market went down, and these three investments I have went up. Why did they go up? Right. So definitely. That's, really important to look at. So it, it actually, in, with respect to that, how often do you look at your IRA performance? Every day. <laughs> okay. I look at it every day because um, first I read about the market in the morning, early, first thing. And then I, I look at my, uh, my portfolio. It's just a way of learning, right? What I, what I'm looking at and what I'm seeing, you know, just like, Put, like whatever I'm learning, I'm 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 trying to you know understand it in real time. So I do it. Every, I look at it every day. Hopefully, you know, maybe when things get better, I won't have to. But well, you know what? And what is it? It's okay to look at every day, right? I mean, part of what we want to look at Harvest too is how do you look at your investments? Like if you look at it every day, like you know, does it put you on edge, or you're looking at it to learn? Like, and again, you know, Darlene. This, uh, this uh, unfortunately is probably a great learning day for your real portfolio because every major index is down. A big, a big fancy terminology in, in finance is called, in the financial world is called correlation. Correlation just means, you know, how much does do two things move together or not? So a lot of times, you, you know, things don't move together. It's kind of like, okay, the Dow Jones is up a little bit today. The S&P 500 was down a little, but there's not a whole lot of like pattern there. But today we can clearly see 
there is a pattern. I'm gonna take out my, my illustrator over here just because it's fun. And I'm going to draw, right? Here's, I'm gonna need to get better at my illustrator skills, right? Everything is down. <laughs> Dow Jones, S&P 500, the NASDAQ, global Dow 3%, everything's down 3%, gold is down and oil's down. So tomorrow morning, open up your, your, your IRA, uh, IRA information, your portfolio, take a look, how did it perform? Right? Was everything down? Was there something up? Right? Was there, was something right. down more than than kind of this three percent benchmark? Right? And it'll be really interesting to see if something basically was unchanged or higher. And take a look. And you know what? You can call me tomorrow. And we can discuss it. And totally. About like <laughs> why why did this perform better? I want to understand. Like it doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, so. Unfortunately, you know, it's not a great day, especially, you know, most people long up, long port, uh, stocks in their port, port, portfolio, but it's definitely a good day for learning, right? Let's figure out why your portfolio is kind of operating the way it is. And maybe there's something to, to really learn from that and help you kind of in your financial future as you build out your portfolio. Awesome. All right, good. So we have a, a little bit of time left. Um, let's talk about just options for uh, a short time because then we have to get to our musical selections and agricultural terminology. <laughs> Very important. Um, you know, options. We, so what is an option? An option is a, is a class of derivative, right? I kind of look at derivatives kind of like, um, well, you know, options, you can do a lot with options, kind of like the baking soda of, of the financial world, right? Because baking soda, I, I just know because with baking soda, we do a lot of science experiments at home and baking soda I mean, is a big part of science. You can make everything, cleaning supplies, everything. Right? It's the best. Yes. It's amazing, right? You put yes. it in the refrigerator, right? You I, put it in the laundry machine. We clean stuff with it. We do so many science experiments with and it. And it saves it's, you so much money too. Yeah, by and I think you bake with it also, also right? Baking yeah. soda is for baking. So, totally. right? So you have this one little product, right? It's the ultimate mm -hmm. derivative. It's probably started with one purpose but it has all these different ways that you can use it. And, you know, I really think that options are in a lot of ways, the baking soda of the financial world, because you have this one concept of the option, but you can do so much, right? So with an option, there are two primary types. You have a call and you have a put. So those are two terminologies that you will hear. I have a call, I have a put, I have a call, I have a put. A call, gives you uh, the opportunity to, we'll just stick with the purchase side uh, for a second, because there are two sides to each call and put, gives you the right to purchase a stock at a certain price. So, and, and it, it, very important is that it's a specific time that you have to purchase that stock by. It's called an expiration date. A little more advanced right now, but time does make, time does play a really interesting, unique and important uh, role that you have to understand in, in, in investing and trading with options uh, and for risk, risk management. But just to start, the call gives you the right uh, as the owner of that call to purchase a stock at a certain price. So for instance, if I buy a, a do, 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 let's gonna go straight to our screen over here. Sorry, I'm gonna stop this. I'm going to pull up. I wanna make sure that you could see it. I'm gonna pull up a screen. My command center over here. And I just want to make sure you can see my command center. Dun, dun, dun. All right, there's my command center. All right, here's my. Can you see my Trade Hawk command center? Yeah. All right, it's crazy looking, right? It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome looking, but it's it's a little crazy. Um, it's so, amazing. Yes, it is a. It's a little too crazy. Uh, all right, so here's my Apple, and it's trading a little under 113. Now, all of these numbers over here are different strikes, which just mean a strike is just the, the, the stock price that I would want to purchase stock at, right? So even though Apple's trading 113, I might say, you know what? I'm really bullish for Apple, meaning I, want the, I think the stock's going to go higher. And I think it's gonna go higher. We're not gonna worry about time right now. And I, I think it's gonna go higher, but instead of buying the stock 100 shares, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy one call and I think it's going to go really higher and I'm going to buy one call on this 120 strike for 68 cents. So what does that mean? So the 120 strike just means that 
I, I would have the right to buy stock, Apple stock at 120 if it goes above, right? Would you buy something for $120 if it was worth 113? No, you wouldn't do that, right? However, if Apple stock zooms up and it's trading 150, it must be pretty good that now you have the opportunity to buy it at 120, right? And that's what options give you the opportunity to do. Now, there's a cost there. In this case, it's 68 cents. Um, and the way options work, it's based on 100 shares of stock. So we have to multiply 67 by 100, so $67. So you have the right to control 100 shares of Apple stock for $67. Um, now, there are some risks involved, right? It's possible by the time that your option expires, Apple never goes above 120. And that means that you don't have any more of that 120 call. It gets a little confusing from there, um, but I wanted to just highlight that it just gives you this right to buy stock at a higher price. And that is good for a lot of reasons, including if you don't have the, the capital or don't want to commit a lot of capital to buying the underlying, there's ways to use a derivative, an option, right? The baking soda of the financial world to do something else. You don't just have to buy the stock. You could buy the 120 call. You could buy what we call call spread, where you limit risk, you limit a little bit of your upside reward, but you also limit your risk, where I can buy the 120 call and maybe sell what they could call selling a strike, maybe on the 124 strike. So now I'm saying, I think I benefit if the stock goes above 120 to 124. So there's a lot of different ways that you can customize your option strategy to take advantage of the idea that the stock's going higher, um, including where do you think it's gonna go higher, right? Do you think it's gonna go a little higher, a, a medium higher or super high, right? It, and that will help determine your strategy. And then puts on the flip side, give you the right to sell stock, right? You think that you, know, you own stock and you're concerned that it may go down. Well, guess what? By buying a put, you can continue owning your stock but if it goes below a certain price, it actually sells your, in some sense, gives you that ability to sell stock and not, um, not incur any more losses as it continues to go down. An example, you're a long Apple stock at $113. And you say, you know what, Ian, I'm concerned about Apple going down a lot because of whatever reason. You, you could buy the 110 put for, let's call it $2. That means you buy that you're given the right to sell stock at 110, which right now, would you want to sell stock at 110 with the stock trading 113? No. no, you wouldn't do that. However, if Apple dropped to $90, right, you would be really happy that you had the opportunity to sell stock at 110 because then the stock that you were originally long, that you originally bought at 113, you got to sell at 110. So you lost $3 plus whatever you paid for that opportunity, which was $2. So you only lose $5 instead of a lot more with the stock trading down $90, right? You would have lost another $18. You would have been down $23, right? But instead now you're only down five. So options really give you a lot of ways. And that's, that's what we call hedging, right? You don't have to hedge. You can just buy a put and say, I'm bearish. I think the stock's going down. So I really, think when it comes back to kind of again baking soda i love baking soda right you just have so many different ways to be proactive and or manage your portfolio with options and again there's so much more we can go into um so i'll stop for a second and ask some questions and then we'll wrap up with our all important agra music if i have a quick question if you buy a call option yes. is there an obligation to you know to uh do anything or perform you know anything after or before the expiration date or is it more like you have no there is no application that is the question of the webinar podcast awesome question <laughs> by buying it you do not have an obligation excellent question you're not stuck where the stock goes down like you had to buy it at 120 it's an awesome question no you have the right but not the obligation as the call buyer Okay. Now, there is something a little more sophisticated where you can be the call or advance, I should say, call seller. Okay. When you're the call seller, you do have that obligation. 
So if you sold that 120 call and the Apple zoomed up to 150, well, guess what? Someone's going to want their stock at 120 because it's thirty dollars higher, and you have that obligation to deliver that stock. If it is that when that you free. borrow stock from someone, kind from, of. So I, I'm not, I'm not sure what the terminology is. I forgot, but I know I read it somewhere. <laughs> yes, that's a really good question. Being short stock, you're basically short borrowing stock, stock yeah. to. To, you're basically borrowing the stock to sell it. It's okay. it, very similar. Um, it's definitely a really interesting concept being short stock. Uh, great for another webinar podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yes, you know, your question of the, of the day here is, do I have that obligation? And the answer is no. As the call buyer, you have control, right? Which okay. is just a great way. And that's why at Harvest Financial, we really look at defined spreads where you kind of have one buy against one sell because then you limit reward, but you also can manage your risks a lot better and understand how your portfolio will, will act, whether the stock market and your portfolio goes up or down or sideways or does whatever. Um, so really great question. So you said that with option or with the call option, you get to manage your own, um, you get to manage, you know, what you can get to control what you, can perform where you can perform. So are options low risk? Ah, good low question. Risk? Are options low risk? Now, the answer is they definitely can be and they can't. Or right? lower you can, risk. you can do a lot of like, as long as you approach it with some education and an idea of what you're looking for, mm -hmm. you can have a strategy that is low risk, right? Okay. We talked about your being long Apple stock. Well, a really nice low risk strategy is looking for ways to protect that. And there's actually a couple ways to protect it. You're, not, you're probably not surprised to hear there's more than one way to protect yourself with options. You can buy a put against your long stock position in case Apple goes down. So is there risk there? Yes, that Apple doesn't go up and uh, it doesn't go down and that eventually the value of that put that you own goes away. You know, it's kind of like you're buying insurance, right? right? You hope not to use the insurance. So you can kind of look at the same way, right? You buy car insurance, but you're, you got to pay it, but you're sure hoping not to use it, right? right? So it could be the same thing, right? You're buying insurance basically by buying a put on your long Apple stock. And you know what? Maybe you're hoping that you never, never have to use it because, uh, and that you know it's a cost, but you are assuming that it's going to go higher. But if it doesn't, you have this insurance. Um, but there's definitely other ways to take advantage of uh, protection with selling calls. And however, you can also be dangerous with options. Actually, last night's webinar, um, we talked about selling a naked option. A naked option just means that it's one single option. And I, if you sell a put, and actually, it's a perfect example, because last night we talked about in Spiders selling the 324 level put in November 20th expiration, and I believe it was at $6. And let's see where it is today with the stock market down. It is $10.30. So you would already be down $4.30 and kind of completely exposed to the market because you just have this one option on. Um, there's no risk, there's no hedge against it. What could you lose? Well, you know, if the S&P goes down 60 points over the next three weeks, you could lose a lot more. That doesn't mean that the S&P 500 won't be trading $500 in five months from now, but because options have time considerations, you could lose because of that and because the stock, right? You didn't have time for the stock to rebound, right? Your, your naked short puts really are hurting um, your portfolio. So options can be dangerous um, and hurtful to your portfolio, but that's again why we want, especially at Harvested, we want to educate and we want you to be able to look at options systematically and see how it fits your current portfolio and how to add to it, depending upon your you know, financial situation. So there are definitely ways to be safe. Um, and of course, you know, unfortunately, there's ways to do some, you know, have some, you know, you know unsafe uh, positions. So. Well, I want to be safe, so. <laughs> That's good. And you know That's what? Amazing. That's great. You know, there are definitely some people who want to take a lot more risk and they can and they, they have the ability to and uh, um, maybe the financial backing. That's fine, right? There's ways to do that. But like you said, you know what? You want to be safe. You want to approach it with safety. There's definitely ways to do that. Yep. Long-term investment. Yeah, and there's ways to do it, ways to understand right. what the risk is, Yeah. right? 
So great. great. Awesome. All right, super. So let's uh, let's do some important stuff over here. Let's let's talk music for a second. So last week with Ken the Beard, the Bearded Trader. We didn't really get too far with our music, uh, you know. So this is YouTube free audio. Let's see, uh, Darlene, you let me know if anything fits uh, the podcast over here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Can you hear that? No, wait. Oh, you cannot. All right. Let's no. see. Uh, give me one second. I may have to share computer sound. There we go. It should automatically do that. I don't know why it doesn't. All right. Let's try. <laughs> Oh, I, I like that, too. Like that? It's, it's very, it's very, uh, elevator. <laughs> I love that. It's a, it's a fashion show. All right, I'm going to write Electronic, I think it was dance and electronic. Or... Oh, let's see, where did it go now? I, I lost it. All right, I have to, uh, we'll find this. All right, so while we while I find our, our potential new, our uh, our song over here, so take me down, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Let's filter. So let's talk, uh, when you think agriculture, what's one terminology that, that you know, comes to your mind? What's one word? Could be a phrase. Yield. Yield. I like that yield on here we go. Here's here's our okay. uh, Welcome to the Weekly Cultivation. I'm your host, Ian Maddy. From Homes and Financial. We're here today with Darlene Breda discussing your personal financial journey. Uh, okay. Awesome. I like it. Yield. All right, so we're gonna finish up in the next 30 seconds. Yield. All right, I like that yield. All right, it's yield. That's a good one. We'll have to work that in more yield. All right. It's a lot we could do that, including community yield. Community yield. <laughs> and uh, would you like to end with anything about community yield? Yeah. So as Ian mentioned, uh, community yield uh, strives to unburden the challenges of money through financial education and uh, we and provide the resources needed to grow opportunities for individuals and communities across Chicago and uh, across other states like New Jersey, North Carolina, 
uh, California. So we're excited about it. And um, hopefully, you know, we can, uh, once we get uh, more partnerships going, we can maybe set up a podcast on that. So. That is super. All right, Darlene, I want to thank you so, so much for uh, being my guest today. And I, I had fun. I learned a lot. I yeah, I, I, I had a great time. Thank you. And definitely reach out to me the next day uh, about your portfolio and if anything kind of moved differently than the market, because unfortunately, today is a good day to kind of look at that because okay. everything is moving together. Everything's highly correlated. So let's see, did your mark, did your portfolio move the same way the entire market or do something different? Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, hit you up on that. All right. All right. Thank this you. has been uh, the weekly cultivation podcast and uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Darlene.